Hey there guys and gals, Zip is F1 backwards here and welcome back to another top 10. And this is another goddamn tricky video I have put upon myself. This is the best indie games of the decade. Now I've already done a best AAA game of the decade which was pretty hard enough and you'll find that at the end of this video and a description below if you want to check that one out. Again, just as in the AAA video, this one had my head blown wide open. I thought this was going to be an easier list, but there have been some sensational indie games over the last 10 years or so. I thought I had a definitive list, again, but that'll change quite a few times. But these, I believe, are the best 10 indie games of the decade. Again, let's keep the debate friendly in the comments section, shall we? And once more, I've made it so difficult, but slightly stressfully funny for myself by doing a strict top 10 with no honourable mentions. So, with that being said, let's begin. And coming in at number 10 then, we have Firewatch, and we actually begin with a cracking game. I really enjoyed this one. So Firewatch is basically an adventure game, and you play as Henry, a fire lookout marshal posted to the Shoshone... Or Shoshone? 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 Anyway, whatever. National Forest, one year after the Yellowstone fires in 1988. Strange things begin to happen to him and his supervisor Delilah. That's my daughter's name. Ha! Ah! which conspired with <laughs> with mystery years earlier. Now this is one of those games where it could be so easily led astray and get tedious and boring fast, but it's literally nothing like that at all. It makes you want to keep playing, it makes you want to find out what's happening, and it keeps you wanting more and more as you progress. The more the story gets deeper, and it gets way more interesting. But there's just so much more to it than just the game itself. For one example, the game's environment was modelled by NG, based on a single painting by director Ollie Moss. Now, the only few things that did let it down were sort of little technical issues within the game, and again, the game's ending, which, you know, had a lot of uh, critics and people just a bit disappointed, but overall was pretty fantastic. It sold over 1 million copies by 2016 and is actually still in works for the game to be made into a feature film with good universe. Now that's something I would actually watch and that is just for an excuse to play this brilliant game again. No. Or she thought that the mystery would be enough to bring me back. And at number 9 we have what remains of Edith door. Finch and oh boy don't we have another cracker. What Remains of Edith Finch is a simple walking simulator game and you may think, why is a walking sim part of a game of the decade? And the answer is very simple. The story alone is worth its weight in absolute gold. So you play as Edith Finch and go back to your old family mansion to find out a little bit more surrounding the uniquely mysterious ways your family members have died after your mother passes. Slowly and one by one, she learns about her family's deaths by going to their bedrooms and playing out different scenes which led to their demise. Now, the ending is pretty insane too, and one I didn't really see coming here, but I'm obviously going to leave no spoilers. The critics love this game, and rightly so, even to the point where they call the game a video game as an art form. Very high praise indeed. And it was followed up by winning many awards in 2017 and 2018, but the only advice I can give you is... Just go and buy and play it. I promise you will not be disappointed. After you play it and you get more of a feel about what's going on, I highly recommend going to YouTube and looking at Edith Finch theories. There are quite a few about and it's worth watching every single one and uh, trust me, it gets you very, very hooked. Right, coming in at number 8 then is Oxenfree. Now, this was the first game to ever be released by Night School Studio, who would later go on to bring us no, the excellent After Party. And what a first real. game this oh, was. And by the way, now, the, the idea time, was that developers Andy Hines and, and Sean Crankle wanted a completely well, uh, story-driven game devoid of any cutscenes, and the results are pretty There's remarkable. Now, this is a game that reminds you so much of those sort of classic teen films with the visual presentation of it having dark and organic elements with also bright and geometric ones, if that makes sense. Now, another amazing part about it is the game is accompanied by an alternate reality game counterpart. So to summarise this quickly then, 
There were radio frequencies in the game which provided hints to a real phone number that led people to a Twitter account which pointed out a real life location and it goes on for quite a bit so I will leave a link in the description or if you just search up Oxen Free ARG game on Google you will get the whole picture. Either way, apart from the game itself being visually excellent, the presentation and the characters being well like and exceptional, the whole ARG thing really got fans and critics impressed and excited which for a first game left a lasting impression on gamers. The one small thing people were a bit sad about, again, just like quite a few indie games, is the ending. It just left people wanting a bit more. So who knows, maybe an Oxen Free 2 in the future there, guys. And coming in at number 7 is Inside. Now, when Playdead released Limbo, people loved the game so much that they thought there may never be another game to succeed it. Or maybe they did but didn't expect it or just whatever. All we do know is that there was Inside. And not only is it a brilliant game in which an unarmed boy must get through an abandoned city filled with guards, spotlights, guard dogs and more obstacles to get to the end goal which is... Warning, spoiler alert connect himself to a humanoid creature full of limbs called the Huddle, but the ending offers up some brilliant theories as there is no official ending. The, th the three main ones you can see on my very own Inside Games Explained, I'll leave a link in the description below, and Play Dead in their own brilliance left it as an open interpretation ending, so you, the player, have to think about what ending you would personally like. Now that alone is just incredible, but they did a few other things to make the game even better. For example, they switched to Unity to simplify the development, they added their own rendering routines and later released it as an open source creating inside signature unique look. Now all these little things ended up making a big difference and a stunning game. And here we have at number 6, Dead Cells. Now this is a very good example of potentially accidental misleading and what I mean by that is the game looks brilliant, it plays excellent with a good twist but through the game you can collect cells which act as the in-game currency you can use to spend if you get to the vendor between each level. Now I say if because dead cells uses a permadeath system meaning if you die you lose it all. Currency, items etc. But on the plus side any upgrades you make are also permanent, so it's kind of a catch-22 in that respect. But this is where the misleading comes into it. Now if you don't know anything about it, you may think, yeah, but at least the game's pretty easy, or you can quit out and reload when you die. I tell you now, it's nothing, nada, nout like you think. It's being compared to the Souls games, and we all know how friggin' hard they can be. So an indie game with a big, good challenge. I can already hear the achievement and trophy score horse throwing up at the sound of that. Um, but what makes it even more fun is each game is different, so random items and enemy locations with random drops make for an always fun, guessing and otherwise frustrating game. Uh, but another great thing about Dead Cells is they use what's called Twitch integration, allowing viewers on the stream chat to actually influence the game, so for example where the player should go or what upgrades to take. So. If you want fun, annoyance and satisfaction all in one, Dead Cells is definitely the game to go for. And coming in at number 5 we have Hollow Knight. Now this may not have been here at all if it wasn't for a partially funded Kickstarter project for developers Team Cherry who raised over 57,000 Aussie dollars. But fair play to the people chipping in because the Team Cherry guys and gals created a stunning game in Hollow Knight. Now if you read it on paper, it seems like a generic little guy goes on an adventure, fights some bosses, end game, job done. But this game is so much more than that. For instance, the combat is one that's straightforward enough that's kind of tricky to begin with, but the more you get used to it, it rewards your skill and patience with huge, well, rewards. The charm system is another big plus as there is no wrong one you can use so you are always justified in what you purchase. But just like Dead Cells, critics were left frustrated with just how hard it can be sometimes. But the satisfaction levels after beating hard points in the game and bosses is massive. 
funnily enough, it's actually the second game on this list to be compared to Dark Souls games, and once you play it, you will realise why. But again, because the game's that good, you don't really mind unless it's sort of 30 deaths later, and that control is closer to losing its life. But there's a reason it has close to 3 million sales, one you will need to find out for yourself. And here we have at number 4, Valiant Hearts The Great War. What can I say about this game that isn't just goddamn amazing through the whole of it? The reason this is on the list and so high up, as the gameplay is excellent, so not like the previous few on this list, is purely down to the story and personally, my god what a story. Now there's those indie games that have either amazing gameplay but not much of a story and sort of vice versa, but this to me had the both of best worlds, drawing you in from the very off and really not wanting to put it down until you finished. The developers Ubisoft Montpellier wanted to do something different for the World War I centenary in 2014 rather than do another first person shooter or an all out war game. They wanted to create this game focusing attention on all the trials and tribulations in both camps during the war. To do that, they had to listen to first-hand accounts, read letters from actual soldiers of the war, and travel to old trenches in France to get a better understanding of what went on. And what we got was fantastic themes, visuals, music and animation, and although critics were impressed with those, they weren't so much with the gameplay and story which is kinda sad in my opinion. But I promise this is one historically accurate game you will enjoy, and enjoy learning about the small things that happened through the war. Uh, maybe school should be teaching this in schools, eh? Wink wink. And onto the top three we march, and you'd never believe me if I said a farming simulator game would be on this list, let alone in the top three, but trust me, if you've played this game, you know exactly what I mean. So if you've been on Facebook, you remember playing Farmville, right? I mean, for those who haven't, you've played the Harvest Moon series, right? It's essentially those games, sort of mixed into one, but with many a big difference, which just makes this game so damn good. First of all, the whole design of the game was done over four years by just one man, Eric Barone. And he designed this game purposefully to address whatever shortcomings and things that were wrong with other farm sim games, and he did that to absolute super effect. Developers Chucklefish approached Barone and offered to develop the game, which helped as Barone now had more time to complete it. By the end of 2017, it had sold more than 3.5 million copies on Steam, and with it being on Xbox One and PS4 now, those numbers are, well, a lot, lot more. As far as gameplay goes, it's as you'd expect. You harvest and crop veg, you raise livestock, craft goods, mine, develop relationships and blossom romance. But it's all done with such open-endedness, it allows players to take on activities as they see fit. For a game as well designed and brilliant as this, for just $11.99, man that's a pretty big bargain. Top 2, and in 2nd place it was a close close call between this and the number 1. Journey is something that you simply just need to experience it. So this isn't just your typical, you go on an adventure, and meet some dudes, get to the end, job done. But bear with me as I explain. So you are a hooded figure, you meet others on your way and can help and assist but you cannot communicate with them and don't find out their name until the very end of the game, after the credits. The only way of communication is through a musical chime which transforms the dull bits of cloth to a nice vibrant red which in turn affects the game world therefore allowing the player to progress. It's such a clever and uniquely different way of playing and developers, that game company, said they wanted to create an emotional attachment between the player and the strangers they meet by evoking into the player a sense of smallness and wonder. Now the art and graphics are pretty phenomenal and has won several Game of the Year awards and it's hard to explain such a brilliant game but if you play and for those who have you'll know exactly what I mean. Now here's hoping for a journey too. And here we are, numero uno, number one, and in my opinion, the greatest indie game this decade is Cuphead. Am I wrong? There's so much that's so good about this game. Studio MDHR thought, hmm, what's popular at the minute? 
rolled up their sleeves and said screw that. And what we got was something memorable and utterly insanely brilliant. It's one game that stands out straight away for its gorgeous 1930s art style and feel. The game itself centers around one or two characters going through levels with big old boss battles at the end, and from that it may sound pretty typical, but due to the high difficulty, it can be both a frustration and a pleasure. It was one of those games that instead of getting angry and controller throwy, it was that good and fun, it just made you want to dig deeper and smash it. But the legacy of the game is also something that continues to thrive. A game called Enchanted Portals, which, if you look at it, draws extremely, extremely similar comparisons to Cuphead, and it was criticised heavily. Although, those devs for that game insisted it just drew very heavy inspiration from Cuphead, is different, and it's not a copy of. And also coming to a Netflix near you, The Cuphead Show, a cartoon based off of the game itself, and with it, Cuphead the game continues to grow from strength to strength. And there we have it then, that list is complete. Now that's what I thought were the best 10 indie games of the decade, but what did you think? Were there any in there that you would have taken out or put in yourself? Let me know in the comments section below, and again, let's keep the debate friendly, shall we? Anyway, thanks so much for watching guys and gals, and if you did enjoy, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe for 100% guides, top 10s and more great content, and I shall see you in the next one.